How did Ed use stories? Chris Palamas, Boston, Massachusetts. Well, you know, Ed's own description of, and he describes a number of critical turning points in his life, the, the moment at which he decided he wanted to live. Um, after those many months in the hospital, he went home. He was isolated for a number of years. And, and finally, with his mother's insistence, with Zona's insistence, Zona, who is herself a legend in the disability movement, um, uh, one of the breakthroughs was when he began to go to school. And uh, the first time he went to school, back to school one day a week, um, his fear of being stared at. And as he drove up to campus on that first day, and I think it was his brother Ron who was getting him out of the, uh, the station wagon, um, in which he was his sitting and getting him into his chair what he was terrified of happened which was students who were a couple of hundred as he remembered who were around a courtyard having their lunch turned and stared at him um, he had this kind of epiphany that first of all being stared at didn't hurt um, secondly being stared at it wasn't his issue because when he would look at these folks they would turn away if they were turning away well it was their stuff, not just his. And he's, his recollection is at that moment, he started to conceive of himself as a star. He could think as this attention was directed at him. It's a kind of a psychological judo, I think. You know, rather than being embarrassed, rather than withdrawing the rest of that, he took that energy of the stare and he redefined himself and he said, I am a star. And the nature of his stardom was um, as a storyteller. And that storytelling manifested both verbally but also visually. He knew that people were immediately fascinated just to see him. They had not encountered someone with that level of disability before. When I first heard Ed speak in, in Boston, I saw the magic of his rolling into the middle of a room in that huge chair. By then, he had control of an electric wheelchair. It was many years before that happened, um, but he had control of an electric wheelchair that he was running with this trace motion. I think it's his left hand, two fingers and a touch in his wrist, and a couple of toes. And with that, just two fingers in his wrist, he would maneuver into the center of a room, and then he would start adjusting his chair. The back would come up, the legs would come up, he would get himself to a level now where he could make eye contact. Now what I learned later from um, Joan Leon, who is a very close associate of Ed, but it was theater. He knew that just that physical action, that set of physical actions was mesmerizing. And that's what happened in the room that day. People were now completely focused and entranced. And then Ed started to tell his story. Now, I've been trying to figure out exactly the date. I think it was probably 1976. I think it is by then director of rehab in California. The reason I think it's 76 is because his theme was a declaration of interdependence. We had the bicentennial of the country to focus on the declaration of independence, and Ed did that nice little twist. What he called the declaration of interdependence. And the story he told was a story about um, making a very risky decision and going back into the hospital for a period of time because he thought he might, despite the dangers of being under the in control of a hospital environment, of doctors and nurses, he might learn something about being more independent and what he was particularly interested in was being more independent in feeding himself and eating. And the story as he told it was, well, he never did learn to be more independent in, in eating and feeding himself, although he did learn to spit olive pits, which is very good for his respiration. Um, but unintended consequences, the other thing that happened was he met his future wife. She was an occupational therapist. Um, and he tells the story, he met his future wife, and um, they married, and they had their son, Lee, together. Um, so it was kind of a weave of, of themes that people could relate to universally. Um, the theme was interdependence was how much we rely on one another because Ed could not have lived the life he did 
he not only needed the technology, but he needed the support of other human beings, both in terms of family and friendship and community, but also that direct support of personal assistance. And one of the things about Ed, as you got to know him, was there was never a meeting at which Ed did not introduce. His personal assistance was there as a person, not an appendage. There was no meeting at which Ed went to the table and just sat with the mucky mucks, with the high power folks, with the heavy hitters. Ed would go and meet everyone in the environment and he'd make a personal connection. We saw that in, in Amherst um, at, at a meeting where um, at the Center for Independent Living I had started, although it was years after I had left there, and Ed had come in for a meeting. Now there was a room off to the side in the back. It was the fiscal department. It was the bookkeepers. And Ed, before he came to the table for the very important meeting we were holding, whatever that was, he went off and worked his way through the whole place, including into that back room, and he met every bookkeeper, every clerk, every secretary, every person there, and made that connection with him.